In eastern Ohio, along the Tuscarawas River, stands a stone obelisk, a memorial marker for 90 Moravian Indians who were murdered here one winter morning. It was a massacre that remains to this day one of the most cold-blooded murders in the nation's history. In 1782, the village of Gnadenhuten was one of the three Moravian settlements along the Tuscarawas River. Gnadenhuten, German for Huts of Grace, was inhabited by Delaware and Mohican Indians who had been converted to Christianity by Moravian missionaries. Ten years earlier, the chief of the Delaware Indian tribe had invited Reverend David Zeisberger to move his missions to their land in the Tuscarawas River Valley, known then as the Muskingum River. Eager to move the missions away from the influence of white settlements in Pennsylvania, Zeisberger had arrived with several other Moravian missionaries and a group of Delaware converts. In just five years, the German Protestant sect had attracted over 400 new Indian converts. David Zeisberger had come to the American colonies as a teenager to escape religious persecution in his native Europe. He had spent most of his adult life as a missionary among the Eastern Woodland tribes and was fluent in five different Indian dialects. The Moravians' main goal was to convert the Indians to Christianity. They didn't want to add numbers necessarily to the membership of the Moravian church. They wanted good, loyal Christians. And they'd had a lot of trouble in their missions in New York and Pennsylvania because of disturbances with their colonial neighbors. So the Ohio country was not um, available for settlement at that time. It was only inhabited by Indians. So they thought that they would have more success without that previous stress here in the Ohio country. They made Christianity seem appealing by presenting a lot of the positive themes of Christianity the love of Christ and forgiveness and the idea of eternal life. The Indians could also see that life in the missions was very stable, and I'm sure that this was probably one of the most appealing factors that tempted them to live in the missions or even consider it because their traditional life had been so drastically disrupted over the past several decades. Conversion to the Moravian faith and to Christianity was a long, gradual process. And the missionaries actually achieved it more by patience and example than by fire and brimstone method. You had to go through a long, arduous process of religious training and being interviewed and counseled by the missionaries and going through a trial period of proving that you were really worthy of baptism. So if you went through all that, you were probably going to be a very sincere convert. The Moravians encouraged their Indian converts to adopt white manners of dress and to take up farming as their main means of living. The villages were built in the fashion of white settlements, with hewn log houses, fenced-in gardens, a public meeting house, and a school. Life at the mission was pretty different for the converts from their traditional life in the villages. Um, the missionaries didn't really try to interfere with their domestic life um, and changing their way of cooking food or building houses. Those kinds of things were pretty much the same, but. The structure of their life was very different. Um, the town itself was laid out in a very organized fashion, and life was operated not exactly scheduled, but a more regimented way. There were regular church services, regular organizational meetings, and other scheduled activities. Uh, one of the unique things about Zeisberg and his missionary program, and here he differs from all the other many, many Protestant missionaries, is that he envisioned Instead of the Indians coming all the way over to the white man's culture, he envisioned that the, this would be like a halfway house. He borrowed something from the Indian culture and he borrowed something from the white culture. And this was someplace in between. There were things they gave up, but there were things they gained from this too. There is another aspect, which is why would the Delaware Indians accept uh, being indoctrinated by these uh, European missionaries. And that's another interesting question because for some 10,000 or more years, the Delaware uh, philosophy, the Delaware rules of life, the Delaware codes of conduct, the, the Delaware's religion had, had, had done very well for them. They had survived in that area. And in fact, whenever they had had a disease or whenever they had been overrun by an enemy, 
uh, their medicine men would say you have we vi it's because we violated our, our codes of morality and if we attend to our religious ceremonies and attend to what we should do and conduct ourselves properly then the deer will come back and the disease will go and it had worked for 10,000 years come the 1600s it wasn't working smallpox other diseases that they had no chance to survive were wiping them out no matter how they conducted themselves morally they were dying Delaware converts who were here were really hideaways from their time. The, the, most of the Delaware tribe at this point in time were hostile to the Americans and were actively supporting the British in the war on the frontier. The Moravian goal essentially was to Europeanize the converts. What they were hoping for was that when uh, white settlements finally arrived in this area that the new settlers would look at these people as a, as a civilized, Christian, hardworking, uh, good human beings with whom they could uh, harmonize. Um, it was a great dream. The fact of the matter was, however, that it wasn't real not considering the temper of the people who were coming. The white settlers of the western frontier were mainly poor farmers. Most were recent immigrants from Ireland, Scotland, and Germany. They had traveled to the edge of the wilderness in the hope of obtaining what they could never afford near the cities, land of their own. Their quest for what they saw as unclaimed wilderness had put them at odds with the native Indians. The eastern tribes watched their land slowly being overrun with white settlements. It was a very hazardous form of life. The settlers uh, never knew when they were going to open their cabin door whether they were going to be shot right on the doorstep or not, because very often the Indians would lie in hiding all night, just waiting for someone to open a door or a window so they could kill them. Uh, their cabins were burned, their livestock was slaughtered. Uh, this all sounds very terrible, but the Indians were in a position where their land was being taken from them. Uh, the whites were encroaching on land that they did not have any right to. And this was the only way they could try to get them to move back where they belonged. And it was a very brutal and disastrous time for many people on both sides. The American Revolution was entering its sixth year. Washington had defeated Cornwallis at Yorktown the previous fall, and the war had settled into a general stalemate. Unable to mount another major military offensive, the British now looked for other ways to continue the war in the colonies. The English had maintained a fort at Detroit since the French and Indian War. From there, they encouraged their Indian allies to step up their raids on the frontier settlements. With supplies from Detroit, the Ohio tribes drove the frontier people of Kentucky and western Pennsylvania into their stockades. We were obliged to live in forts in this country, and notwithstanding all the caution that we use, 47 of the inhabitants have been killed or taken by the savages. Whole families are destroyed without regard for age or sex. Infants are torn from their mother's arms and their brains dashed out against the trees. Not a week passes and some weeks barely a day without some of our distressed inhabitants feeling the effects of the infernal rage and fury of those hellhounds. John Floyd. At the alarm, the people flew to the fort, leaving all their property in their cabins all which was plundered. Some of the cabins were burned and others were seized and occupied by the Indians from which to fight. Francis Duke came about noon and made a dash for the fort and was shot dead. They dragged his body into one of the cabins and scalped and stripped him. Lydia Boggs. The largest American fort along the frontier was Fort Pitt, which stood at the mouth of the Ohio River. Its walls look down on the small border town of Pittsburgh. The previous fall, Washington had appointed a new commander to the fort, General William Irvine. 
Born in Ireland, Irvine had once been a British naval surgeon. He had served with distinction in the American Army from the start of the war. What he found on his arrival at the fort shocked him. The 300-man garrison had not been paid or provided with clothing or supplies for two years. Desertion and disease had also led to the deplorable state of the men. Irvine quickly wrote to inform Washington of the conditions there. I never saw troops cut so truly a deplorable and at the same time despicable a figure. Indeed, when I arrived, no man would believe from their appearance that they were soldiers. Nay, it would be difficult to determine whether they were white men. Already unable to pay the current war debt, Congress refused his request for aid. Irvine realized his forces were inadequate to carry out an offensive campaign against the Indian tribes of the Ohio country. For nearly 10 years, the inhabitants of the three Moravian settlements had attempted to live peacefully in the midst of the brutal border wars that had raged around them. They soon found themselves caught in the middle. The Wyandot and Delaware tribes attempted to force the Moravians to take sides against the Americans, but they refused. Although Zeisberger claimed to remain neutral in the conflict, he was, in fact, very much pro-American. With the headquarters of the church located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, the only way for the missions to survive was to side with the colonists. Zeisberger and his associate, John Heckewelder, often sent communications to Fort Pitt, relaying information about war parties headed to raid the white settlements. There was never any question in Zeisberger's mind where his political allegiance lay. It had to lay with the colonials rather than the British. All during the time that he was in this valley, even before the war started in 75, he maintained very close connections with the commanders at Fort Pitt, and they changed from time to time. So when a war party come down through this area going to attack the western frontier, Zeisberger would just sit down and ride out, send it over to Fort Pitt. Took him a couple of days for an express rider to get there. Well, the commander at Fort Pitt notified all the forts up and down along the river, see, and here they were sitting waiting for him when they attacked these forts. The British commander at Detroit was Major Arendt de Peister. For some time now, he had been receiving complaints that the Moravians were acting as spies for the Americans. Governor de Peister, or Major de Peister, was the uh, commander of the British forces on the frontier, stationed out of Fort Detroit. The British Indian Department was directly under his control. The Indian Department was headed by Alexander McKee and contained some 50 to 80 independent uh, white Indian language speaking agents who were assigned as military advisors to various hostile allies of the British Indian groups. Uh, the job of these agents was to live with uh, the people to whom they were assigned to uh, make sure that they had uh, provisions with which to continue raiding against the Americans, to accompany the raiders, to pick up military intelligence that was important to England, um, and a number of other functions. These agents, um, of which uh, Simon and James and George Gertie, the three Gertie brothers, were agents, uh, often were in a position to intercept uh, documents and messengers in the region uh, that were working for the Americans. And in fact, a full year before um, the Ganadin Hooten massacre, uh, documents were captured, unquestionable proof and evidence that Heckwelder was sending military intelligence to Fort Pitt. De Peister finally ordered the Wyandots to go to the missions and force the Moravians to abandon their towns. They were to move to the Indian villages at Sandusky, either voluntarily or by force. He insisted that the move would be to keep the Moravians out of harm's way. In reality, he knew it was the only way to stop them from continuing to provide information to the Americans. In August, a group of over 300 warriors and British troops arrived at Gnadenhuten. For two weeks, they tried to persuade Zeisberger and the Moravian converts to abandon their settlements. The chief of the Wyandot, Pomoakan, made one final appeal to the Moravians. 
My cousins, ye believing Indians, I am distressed on your account. You live in a dangerous place. Two mighty and wrathful gods stand opposed to one another with extended jaws, and you, seated between them, will be destroyed by one or the other. You will be crushed between their teeth. You must not remain here. Remember your women and children. Care for their lives. Here they will all perish. The first approach was a kindly approach, you know. Look, you're, you're going to have to move out of the valley. You know, we know you're sending this intelligence. We, we can't put up with that anymore. Elliot, who headed the party of Matthew Elliot, uh, he was representing to Pricer. And this Pricer had given him strict orders. Look, when you go down there, they come out. No equivocation, no delay. You take them out one way or another. If they come peacefully, fine. If they don't, force them out. Well, it finally got to that point. And he, Pomokin goes to Zeisberger and says, okay, now, you've got to come out. You've got to give me an answer. Are you or aren't you going to come out? Zeisberger does a thing that was part of the religious mechanism of the Moravian church, and that's the casting of lots. In other words, they would, they would put three slips of paper in there. They'd have a question before them, three slips of paper. Yes, we'll do it. No, we won't. Or the third one was, we'll delay it to another, an, another time. And they cast the lot. It was a ridiculous thing. The, this whole procedure was ridiculous. And even people in the Moravian church at the time thought it was ridiculous, but they still did it. And the result was, no, don't you, don't, you can't leave. That God, you have given enough, God told them. This was supposed to be the word of God coming. They did a lot of prayer over this before they... And he went to promote it and says, no, we can't go. Well, that was it. So... It, it was a terrible, terrible mistake on Zeisberger's part, and I think afterwards he realized it. That's probably one of the worst mistakes that he made in all his time, because what they suffered, because of the way they were taken out, contributed to the problems they had, had after that. But he just was stubborn, and he followed that lot. When the Moravians still refused to leave, the mood of the warriors became grim. They were stripped of most of their possessions, their cabins were looted, and the livestock were slaughtered and left dead in the streets. The once tidy village was left in ruins. Driven on an arduous 20-day journey, the converts would walk nearly 150 miles before they arrived at the site near the Wyandotte villages. As the weather grew colder, they built a few hasty shelters and prepared for a hard winter. Forced to leave most of their provisions behind at the settlements, David Zeisberger could only watch in frustration as his followers starved. February 10th, 1782. The hunger among our people is so great that for some time they have had to live upon dead cattle and horses. Never in their lives have they felt such want. We pity these people, but we cannot, we know not how to help them. Why does the Savior let all this come upon us? Desperate for food, the group of 140 converts began the long journey back to the abandoned missions. They planned to salvage the corn that had been left standing in the fields. With luck, it would be enough to keep the converts alive until spring. The frontier people of western Pennsylvania distrusted the Moravians as much as the Wyandotte did. They saw the missions as a convenient halfway point for war parties on their way to raid the white settlements. Many believed that if the Moravian towns were destroyed, the attacks on their cabins would stop. A settler named Joseph Vance had constructed a fort in Washington County, Pennsylvania, where 30 families had taken refuge. Frustrated at having to be confined to the fort walls, the inhabitants often discussed the Moravian settlements. Vance said to a neighbor, there is no use talking. This thing will never be better until the halfway houses are destroyed. Another man replied, yes, and I will be one of the company to go and wipe them out. On February 17, 1782, 
A settler named Robert Wallace returned to his cabin to find it deserted. Indian raiders had attacked the cabin and taken his wife and three children as prisoners. News of the capture of Wallace's family was the final straw for the Pennsylvanians of Washington County. Two weeks later, a hundred men, most between the ages of 18 to 20, crossed the Ohio River and headed for the Moravian missions. On the morning of March 6th, they approached the settlement of Gnaden. A mile from town, they surprised a young Indian boy named Joseph Shabash and shot him through the arm. As he begged for mercy, a tall captain named Charles Bilderbeck killed the boy with a tomahawk and scalped him. The militia then split into two groups, intent on entering the village from two directions. The group's leader, Colonel David Williamson, took 16 men and crossed to the west side of the Tuscarawas. They found most of the Moravians working in a cornfield. Williamson approached the group and called out a greeting. The elder of the group, Abraham, recognized Williamson and returned the greeting. Williamson told him that they had been sent to escort the Moravian converts back to Fort Pitt where they would be safe for the remainder of the war. Convincing them that they were to be their bodyguard, they were persuaded to hand over their weapons to the Pennsylvanians as a sign of good faith. When the Indians saw that there were Americans coming, uh, they were overjoyed. They believed they had been saved. They wouldn't have to go back to Sandusky where they were starving in the cold. The Americans would come and take them to Pittsburgh and they would be taken care of. They would survive. They were overjoyed. Um, they were also, because of their Moravian conditioning, they were hospitable and, and open. Um, Williamson, of course, took advantage of that in rounding them up. In fact, he promised that he would take them to Pittsburgh, to Fort Pitt. They had a lot of contact with American militia. Uh, they trusted the American soldiers. They trusted the American militia because there had been no evidence that they were out to get them in any way at all. So when they approached them, under the guise of friendship, they had no reason not to uh, be submissive. And the thing that Zeisberger was, that never could understand was, why did they give up their arms? Th th they should have known right away when they were asked to give up their arms that something was rotten here in Denmark. When the Moravians entered the village, they found themselves surrounded by Williamson's men. The men were bound and taken into the meeting house. The women and children were taken and locked into a nearby cabin. Williamson sent runners to the settlements of Salem and New Schoenbrunn to tell the Indians there that they should all gather at Gnadenhuten. When the Pennsylvanians reached New Schoenbrunn, they found the village deserted. Several days earlier, Zeisberger had sent a messenger back to the settlements to insist that the Indians return to the Sandusky villages. On the way to Gnadenhuten, the messenger found the mutilated and scalped body of Joseph Shabash. After finding signs of a large force of men, he guessed the fate of the inhabitants of Gnadenhuden and ran to warn those who were at Nushonbrun. The Moravians there fled. Zeisberger had unknowingly saved their lives. The next day, the Moravians from Salem arrived at Gnadenhuden. They were bound and imprisoned in the same cabins as their friends. Outside, the militia was huddled together, discussing what was to be the fate of their captives. As night fell, Williamson put the question to the militia. Were the Indians to be taken to Fort Pitt or put to death? He asked those in favor of sparing the Moravians to step forward and form a second rank. The first to step forward was a young preacher named Edward Christie, whose fiancée had been captured by a war party. He had gladly joined in the campaign, but the idea of murder horrified him. Robert Wallace, whose family had been taken prisoner three weeks before, remained in the first rank. 
Nearly every man there had seen members of his family and neighbors murdered by war parties, and the desire for vengeance was strong. They saw their prisoners as the enemy, regardless of their religious beliefs. Only 17 others stepped forward. 83 men had voted for the death of the Moravians. When the decision was announced to the Moravians, it was met with stunned silence. The Pennsylvanians had found utensils and other implements in the cabins and claimed they had been stolen from the white settlements, proof of the Moravians' guilt. Abraham declared that they could call God to witness that they were perfectly innocent and yet they were prepared for death. He asked that they be allowed to spend the night in prayer. Williamson granted their request and they were locked into the cabins. The condemned Moravians spent the evening praying and singing hymns encouraging each other to remain faithful to the end. Early the next morning, the militia gathered to draw lots to see who would have the privilege of killing the first of the Moravians. Captain Charles Bilderback drew the winning lot and led the group that entered the meeting house. He grabbed Abraham and pulled him outside into the street. Another man stepped up to Bilderback and handed him a large cooper's mallet he had found in one of the cabins. Bilderback swung the hammer above his head and quickly brought it down, crushing Abraham's skull. He re-entered the meeting house and demanded that the Moravians be placed shoulder to shoulder facing the wall. Bilderback stepped up behind them and in quick succession, he killed 13 others, caving in the back of each of their heads with a single blow. Breathing heavily, he finally stepped back and handed the heavy mallet to another man. My arm is failing me, he said. You go on in the same way. I think I've done pretty well. As the next man continued the massacre, Bilderback scalped each of his victims. In the next cabin, the same hideous scene was in progress. In pairs, the women and children were dragged into the Cooper's cabin, which the militiamen had dubbed the Slaughterhouse. They too were bludgeoned to death and scalped. Down by the riverbank, the 18 men who had refused to be a part of the killing stood silently, listening to the muffled noises coming from the cabins. Robert Wallace came running down to the bank, his clothes spattered with blood. Breathing heavily, he burst into tears and cried, You know I couldn't help it. When the bodies had been scalped and the other cabins ransacked, the men piled the corpses into the two cabins, set them on fire, and rode out of the village. Back at the Sandusky village, David Zeisberger was becoming concerned. It had been 10 days since he had sent a messenger to bring back the Moravians to the settlements, and there had been no word about them. A week later, he would learn the horrible truth. Two young boys named Thomas and Jacob staggered into the Sandusky villages. Jacob had been on his way back to Gnadenhuten when he saw the militia herding the Moravians into the cabins. He had hidden in the brush and watched the horrific scene unfold. Thomas was covered in blood, and he had been scalped. He told the hellish story of the slaughterhouses. After being dragged into the Cooper's cabin, the boy was clubbed and knocked unconscious. He awoke to find himself buried beneath a pile of bodies. He had watched as the blood ran in streams across the cabin floor and dripped down into the cellar below. Struggling out from underneath the pile of corpses, the boy ran off into the woods. March 23rd, 1782. This news sank deep in our hearts that these are brethren who as martyrs had all at once gone to the Savior. They were always day and night before our eyes and in our thoughts, and we could not forget them. But this in some measure comforted us that they had passed to the Savior's arms where they will forever rest protected from the sins and all the wants of the world. Distraught and stunned, 
Zeisberger and the remaining converts moved north into Canada. Uh, Williamson and his militia were on a revenge mission. People where they lived had been slain. Uh, neighbors had been slaughtered. Men, women, and children by hostile Indians who were operating and raiding for the British. And so it really wasn't unusual for American militia on a revenge mission of that sort uh, to be extremely aggressive when they finally caught their target. And their target was Indians. And this is, seven, this is uh, 1782. For more than two and a half years, um, it had been normal for the American forces operating on the frontier uh, to make no effort in determining whether Indians they ran into were uh, pro-American or neutral or hostile. They were considered hostile if they were in this region. Now you have to understand what had been going on for 15 years, ever since the French and Indian War. These people had seen their wives, their husbands, their children, their cousins, their aunts, and their uncles, their grandfathers and grandmothers, murdered by the Indians. And they just had enough. And they weren't about to distinguish between the praying Indians and the native Indians. They just weren't about to do that. They were all the same to them. But I can understand the motivation of the soldiers who were involved. The extraordinary thing wasn't that the Americans slaughtered these uh, Christian, innocent, uh, friendly uh, Delawares. The extraordinary thing was that these were perhaps the among the only Delawares who at this point in time during the Revolutionary War still believed that being Christian, uh, being people of the book, and that being friendly to Americans, that they would be treated with some justice and equanimity. Um, the rest of the Delawares at this point of the war understood that they were fighting a fight for survival and that uh, the Americans were extremely hostile. Within weeks, newspapers in New York carried stories of the massacre. New York Gazette, April 29th, 1782. You have heard it that last fall, the three Indian congregations on the Musk Kingdom were carried away to Sandusky Creek. Being in a place destitute of everything, Want and hunger forced them to go back to their former towns to seek what had not been destroyed. On this occasion, many of them have been murdered in a most inhumane manner. This has been reported and confirmed by several persons who came out of Pittsburgh, some of whom have been present at a venue made of items carried off as booty after the slaughter. General William Irvine, the commander at Fort Pitt, returned to Pittsburgh from a visit to his family. He was stunned by news of the massacre. Fearing the incident would hurt his reputation and realizing local opinion supported the murders, he remained silent. In a letter to his wife, he urged her to do the same. Whatever your private opinion of these matters may be, I conjure you by all ties of affection, as you value my reputation, that you will keep your mind to yourself and that you will not express any sentiment for or against these deeds as it may be alleged the sentiments come from me. No man knows whether I approve of killing the Moravians. The politicians to the east were very upset by it uh, because it, it caused a lot of problems in their dealing with British authorities with whom they were trying to set up peace talks at the present time and leading up to the Paris Treaty. Uh, the The principal frontier people right on the border were, were delighted that it had happened and they thought that it would teach all the Indians a lesson and believed that they should immediately follow it up with a, a deeper attack into Indian country, into the uh, towns of the Sanduskies and uh, get into that area and wipe them all out. So it was, it was a mixed reaction. Uh, Washington deplored it, Ben Franklin deplored it, a lot of people deplored it but uh, a lot of it was just talked to. Before the massacre, a significant number of the Indians of that region 
were really uncommitted. They didn't know whether to fight for the British, stay out of the war, fight for the Americans, or really what was the best course for them. But after this massacre, the issue was no longer in doubt at all. They figured that if the Americans would come and uh, execute uh, men, women, and children who were pro-American, pacifists, uh, Christians, who had been hospitable to them traditionally, then the obvious question for them was, what would happen to us if the Americans win the war? If they do that to them, what will they do to us? As word of the true nature of the campaign became known, Williamson and the others attempted to justify the atrocity by claiming that bloody clothing had been found in the village. Some claimed that the mutilated bodies of Robert Wallace's wife and child had been found along the trail. In truth, Wallace believed his family was still alive. Two months later, an even larger force crossed the Ohio on an expedition the militia dubbed the Second Moravian Campaign. Its outcome would be very different from the first. The 480-man army was made up of many of the men from the first campaign, but was led by the 55-year-old Colonel William Crawford, a close friend of George Washington. The men rendezvoused at a place called Mingo Bottom. Uh, there was a question who was going to command, whether David Williamson, Colonel David Williamson, who had commanded uh, at the massacre of Gnadenhutten, would command, or whether William Crawford, who was second in command at Fort Pitt, would command. And they had an election, and uh, Crawford won by a few votes. The men camped, and they were pretty excited and pretty happy about the whole event. Uh, there was some drinking and some celebrating the first night. None of them knew, of course, that even before they got to Mingo Bottom, British allied Indian uh, spies were, were, were following every move they made and picking up every bit of information they could uh, in hopes of determining where this expedition was really headed. Um, the uh, Americans, some of the Americans that night, uh, during their celebrating, uh, peeled some bark off a tree. And they took their knives and they carved no quarter to Indians. Of course, meaning, very simply, that they were announcing that wherever they went, uh, it was not going to be just, uh, their actions would not be demonstrated only against uh, warriors, but that they were prepared to destroy Indians, any size, any variety. Um, when the men moved out the next morning, the camp was carefully gone over by the uh, Shawnee and Wyandotte spies. They were unable to read the message on the tree. So they took a buckskin and some charcoal from one of the fires, and they traced the words. Two days later, that deerskin with its tracing was given to Allied, or given to British Allied uh, force, British forces to translate. And at that point in time, they were raising uh, Indian forces to combat against Crawford and his men. And it, it, it flashed through all those people that, of course, the, it, was, it was very clear that the Americans meant to come and exterminate uh, innocent Indian women and, and children uh, in their tour. And this, of course, uh, the result of that was that uh, some 1,500 Indians were quickly raised, which had never happened before. Uh, along with British Rangers and, uh, and British regulars. And of course, Crawford was heading into uh, an overwhelming trap. Near the Sandusky villages, the army was surrounded. At a wooded grove named Battle Island, the outnumbered militia held off their attackers as they made plans to attempt an escape. In the dark of night, a panicked retreat by a few men soon became a rout. The Wyandotte and Delaware hunted down the fleeing Pennsylvanians capturing a number of them, including Crawford. Many of the perpetrators of the massacre, including Williamson and Bilderback, escaped. Flush with victory, the Delaware were determined to take revenge for their murdered tribesmen. Although Crawford had not been involved in the murders, he became the focus of their rage. He was burned at the stake in a ceremony of torture that would become one of the most frightening tales to reach the white settlements in the East. Rifle barrels filled with gunpowder were first fired into his skin, 
His ears were cut off, and he was scalped. Prodded with firebrands, it would take him nearly three hours to die. Finally, his bloody charred corpse was thrown into the fire. Irvine and local politicians had advised against investigating the massacre, but in June, Congress appointed a commission to look into the murders. No one could be found who would admit to having been on the campaign to the Moravian towns. The investigation was finally dropped. Three years after the murders, Robert Wallace learned that his wife and youngest child had been killed just days after they had been taken prisoner. The next summer, Thomas, the only survivor of the massacre, was found dead. Since the massacre, he had suffered from convulsions as a result of the concussion he had received. While crossing a river, he had lapsed into a seizure and drowned. Colonel David Williamson, the leader of the raid, was elected sheriff of Washington County. He died a pauper in 1814 and was buried in an unmarked grave. The final retribution for the murders would take place five years later. Charles Bilderbeck, who had begun the massacre, was grazing his cattle on the west side of the Ohio River. He was suddenly surrounded by a party of Shawnee and Wyandotte warriors. Telling them his name, he was recognized as the instigator of the Moravian massacre and was tied to a tree. They spent a long time cutting various parts from his body. Finally, they put an end to his agony by splitting his head with a tomahawk. The site where William Crawford was burned became a local tourist attraction in the early 1800s. The location was easily found, as even many years later, grass refused to grow on the spot. The massacre was soon forgotten among the white settlements, but it would never be forgotten by the eastern tribes. It would be a subject brought up in treaties and negotiations with the United States for the next 25 years. David Zeisberger would also never forget what happened that winter in 1782. 16 years later, he returned to the site of the massacre. The bones of the murdered converts were gathered and buried in a mound near the site of the meeting house. Zeisberger went on to start the mission of Goshen, just six miles away, as a center for training new missionaries. He would never again travel to the white settlements of Pennsylvania. He remained active at Goshen until his death in 1808. They came from Europe with the idea that they would help a downtrodden, demoralized, heathen group of people. They came assuming that their own uh, culture, that their own civilization, their own social style uh, was superior, clearly superior. What they were in essence saying to those Indians was, if you shed uh, your baggage, if you learn to speak German, if you dress as Europeans, if you learn to farm and raise cattle the way we do, if you become European and do it our way, you will survive. And the irony, of course, is that the ones who tried it the most were the ones who were massacred by their supposed friends at Gnadenhutten. In 1812, in Burgettstown, Pennsylvania, a crowd had gathered to hear news of the current war with England. A passerby was drawn to a commotion in the center of the crowd. An old man, much the worse for liquor, was singing maudlin songs when someone said, Now, Uncle Saul, show us how they killed the Indians. Then at once the old fellow's whole manner changed from the gay to the grave, and he began crying and cursing the cowards who'd killed the women and children. He seized a long stick in his hands and began beating an imaginary object, all the while howling like a demon. Then somebody pulled him away, saying it was a shame. I learned Uncle Saul had been at the Moravian Massacre and when in his cups would show how they killed the Indians, but when sober, could not be forced to open his mouth on the subject. 